Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss Vincent's paper. Um, and let me start by saying this is an incredibly timely paper. So um, if you were here in the morning for the speech of the governor, I could have used his introduction to the speech exactly as an introduction to Vincent's uh, paper today. But of course, I didn't know exactly what the governor would say. What I did know, though, was what Christine Lagarde said um, not too long ago, exactly one, uh, one month ago today, actually. So what she said was inflation is being caused by a, a series of unprecedented shocks and our policy response will need to account for the special combination of shocks that we are facing in the euro area. So this was from a lecture that she gave a month ago, and this really is exactly relevant for Vincent's paper, or maybe the other way around. Vincent's uh, paper is exactly relevant to inform um, what, uh, well, uh, central banks are talking about right now, in this case here, Christine Lagarde. So what, what is our current situation? Um, we have record high inflation um, now after a very long period where that was clearly not the case. And this inflation is unequally distributed across different goods or across dif different sectors. Um, and also, I mean, inequality has, um, has always been important, but over the last, let's say, two decades, both in society, in academia, and in, for policymakers, this has become much more of a focus. And what is currently really in, in the news and what people are worried about is that in the current situation, low-income households seem particularly hit by the current developments. And this is really what, uh, what Vincent's paper can exactly capture, the model in Vincent's paper. So they built a HANK model, so heterogeneous Asian New Keynesian model, where they have heterogeneous sectors, so it's multiple sectors, they're heterogeneous and they have their own shocks. Then, as is common to HANK models, they're heterogeneous households, they differ by productivity and ultimately by wealth, so there's a distribution of wealth of the households. And then what's crucial, another ingredient of the paper is that um, they introduce non-homothetic preferences for the households. And that means that across, if we look across the, the wealth distribution, we get different consumption baskets, where the expenditure shares on the different goods from the different sectors that varies by wealth. And what that allows uh, the paper to do, or the model to capture, is that we really have sector-specific inflation, also propaga propagation of the shocks, and that the impact is heterogeneous of those shocks. Um, so if it get heterogeneous impacts um, from house, uh, on households across the wealth distribution, which is really uh, exactly at the core of what people are talking about right now. So instead of going through the technical, more technical details of the paper, and I think Vincent has done a great job showing you that just now, um, I'm going to do, take, take a bit of a step back and take more of a, since this is such a timely paper, a bit more bird's eye view, and I'm going to dig deeper into Christine Lagarde's speech, what were the main points that she mentioned, to look at what can we actually right now map already into the paper, what can it speak to directly, and where are um, aspects of what she mentions, which is maybe currently not captured yet, and is something to think about whether you want to uh, go in that direction or not. So I started out with saying the first quote, that there were these unprecedented shocks. What were they? This is what um, she said about the shocks. So the first shock was the pandemic. Pandemic-related supply bottlenecks and rising prices have reinforced each other, with firms reacting to the threat of shortages by ordering more and earlier. So really the pandemic and all those supply shortages which came about from that. And then the second shock that she mentions um, has been the Rus uh, Russia's unjustifiable invasion of Ukraine. Um, the invasion has hugely aggravated the supply squeeze and sent energy prices to extraordinary levels. So those two points, this is really something that, um, that Vincent's paper can speak directly to. This can really directly be mapped into the, into the paper, because really um, they have the multiple sectors, and each sector has their own shocks. So it's, it's, uh, it's directly obvious that we can map shocks to different sectors. In particular, if we think about the second point here, um, the energy price shock due to the invasion, that can directly be mapped into, into the paper, into the model. And then I'm not sure whether you've already implemented it in the current version or whether you're thinking about doing that, but you mentioned that you want to, um, at least want to have the input-output structure between the sectors also in the model, and that would really speak to this first point as well, where we have, we have a shock to the pandemic, which was an aggregate shock, but some sectors were hit more than others, but then through the supply chain, this actually fed through, the, through basically the global economy. So I think if you had these, um, these input-output structures, that would also be uh, directly mapped here. So this is really the strength, the 
core of the paper where you can really see that uh, nicely. And then let me say something what this means, what are the outcomes of those things, um, and that um, kind of for me, well, that's not the only results in the paper, but ones are, which are really relevant for, in, in particular, this background, is that it's really important which sector is hit if we have these sector-specific shocks. So what I'm putting here um, is just an extract of what um, uh, Vincent has just shown you. These are just four of the pictures of we had, I think, five, uh, uh, 10 of them. So on the very left, well, let me see if I get that one. Ah, okay. So if we have the, the, the left one is the aggregate shock, and then I just have three sectors. The first is the food sector, then clothing, and then um, electricity and gas. And what's plotted is the output gap in red, and in black it's the inflation. It's the aggregate variables. And you see that the reactions to which, shock, which uh, sectors are hit is very different. So if it's an aggregate shock, we get a qualitatively different uh, reaction to um, if an individual sector is hit. And again, which sector is hit might have an actually qualitatively different impact impact on those aggregate variables. So which sector is hit um, really matters for the aggregate variables, inflation and output gap, but also it matters for who bears the costs of those shocks. So and that is when, um, when uh, uh, Vincent showed you the, the, the effects on the poorest and the richest. So those are the same four shocks. So it's again the aggregate shock and then those three sectors. And what's plotted is the reaction, the consumption change, the consumption dynamics of the poorest in blue and in red of the, of the richest households in the economy. And what you see is that if food, that's the second or um, on the very right, that's electricity and gas, if those sectors are hit, then it's really the poorest households who bear the costs because that, those are the biggest expenditures in their consumption basket. Whereas, for example, here, if clothing is hit, then it's, in fact, um, uh, the, the richer households who are hit more strongly than, um, uh, than the poorer. So this really rich setup allows us exactly to speak to um, those main points uh, that I mentioned in the beginning. Okay, then the next thing that Christine Lagarde talks about um, that is about fiscal policy. She mentions that twice. So she said, um, first says, the fiscal and monetary policy response to the pandemic has succeeded in protecting nominal incomes, thereby supporting a fast recovery of demand when our economies reopened. Um, and then she comes back to that towards the end um, of her speech when it's about the outlook of what to do. And she says, it will make a difference whether fiscal policy focuses mainly on public consumption and transfers or on public investment and debt sustainability. And this is something that at least, as I read the paper currently right now, that it's harder for the model to capture in, its, in, the, in the current version. Because currently, um, what you write is that um, fiscal policy eliminates steady state markups using subsidies financed by lump sum taxes on firms. So in principle, so that means that fiscal policy is currently passive, which I think is fine because we really want to um, study the impact of monetary policy and the effects of all this heterogeneity, how that alters the trade-offs of monetary policy. But it's not a completely innocuous assumption because, um, as we know, and we briefly talked about this earlier, I think, as well, is that um, in general, with Hanks models, it matters what fiscal policy does. So it matters for the response to monetary policy. That is the general point of those um, of, of Hank models, and also I assume here in the in this um, richer Hank model. But I think it's in particular relevant also in this context. In particular, when you go to the very last point, when you map the the model to the data and you back out the shocks, um, I think we've seen quite unusual fiscal policies happening through the in the recent period. So that during the pandemic, there were really large fiscal stimulus uh, uh, policies packages um, globally, basically everywhere. And right now, with the energy crisis, lots of governments are talking about subsidies, target or not target, to um, to help households deal with the with the, um, the energy uh, increases and also that needs to be financed, and all of that will have an um, impact on what monetary policy does. So I think in particular for this last part, this might be important to, uh, to consider. And then I have one last point, maybe that's the ultimate point, the ultimate question. So here I'm going back to the very first slide that I had, the very first uh, citation, and I want to highlight the second part, and our policy response will need to account for the special combination of shocks that we're facing. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm still, at least in the current stage, I know they're, they're trade-off, but I don't know how they should account for it now. So this goes a bit back to the optimal policy. Um, so, I'm, so it would be super nice to see now that we have the, um, the, the, or at least maybe when you write it up fully 
this will be much clearer. <laughs> but um, what are the trade-offs now? I think in your presentation you already mentioned much more than, uh, than before. What are the new trade-offs which arise? And also what would be very interesting to see is if there is, depending on which shocks have hit the economy, whether that kind of makes the, the, the reaction of monetary policy, how does it work um, based on which shocks have just happened to the, to the economy, if there's anything interesting to see. Now, I think the paper is already quite big and it's very nice. I'm not sure if this is actually this paper or if it's maybe the next paper, but it's something I think is uh, uh, very interesting, would be very interesting. All right, so let me summarize. Um, this is an extremely timely paper and can already capture a lot of the current features of, this, of the features of the current situation. So it's really very relevant. And I've just talked about two extensions, what to maybe um, uh, uh, look at when you keep working on the paper. One was the role of fiscal policy and then the optimal policy if there's a function of the type of shock. Thanks a lot.